Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome to PWLM Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Bishop James Manigault. So excited to have you on with us tonight. Listen, you're in for a treat as we prepare to dive into our word. We have been dealing with how to submit our wills unto Christ. And tonight we're going to be dealing with self-control and discipline. I want you to like, share the video. You don't want to miss this. Come on in. Let me know that you're in the room as we prepare to go into our Bible study. Amen. Praise the Lord, Sister Pam. Praise the Lord, Sister Sharita. Praise the Lord. The Smiths are on. Amen. Brother Charles and Sister Danielle, love to have you. Amen. excited to have you on with us tonight as we are diving into the word. I'm not going to be on for a long time. Praise the Lord, Lady Kim. Um, but we're going to get right into the word of God. And, uh, you know, it's so amazing how we've been witnessing different things happening in the earth. I pray that you've been praying and paying attention. Um, one of the signs that uh, the Bible talks about is people not knowing the signs of the time. That was one of the things the disciples wanted to know. When would be the sign of Christ coming? And then he began to give them a revelation of when he would come back by giving him the signs of the time. Um, and what's very interesting to me is that we live in a day and an age where people um, have lost track of the times. Um, you know, we're excited about a lot of things that are happening in the earth, but are we paying attention to the signs of his coming? Amen. So tonight we're going to dive into the word of God. Praise the Lord, Sister Sarita. And I pray that um, you will be moved, you will be encouraged, you will be inspired by the word. Again, if you uh, have family or friends that are not on Facebook, but they would like to watch this broadcast, they would like to attend our Bible studies or even our services, um, the benefit is that you can go to our website. And we broadcast live from the website. There's a link on there um, that you can go to. And I'm telling you right now, um, they don't have to have a Facebook page. They can log in or just go to the website. Um, that's pwlministries.org and click on the link and it'll take them directly to our Bible study. Also uh, up on YouTube, um, they can watch the previous, not current, but previous um, Bible studies. Um, so again, like I said, like, share the video, praise the Lord, brother Mark, we're going to dive right into our Bible study tonight. So excited to have you on with us as we are studying to show ourselves approved. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A work may need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A lot of things that are going on in our world, in our country, in our nation, um, in your local city um, that we must be aware of. And so we're going to get into the word, um, but before we do, let's have a quick word of prayer, amen, and then we're going to dive right into the word. Again, like, share this video. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you, Lord God, for your power, for your anointing. We thank you, Lord God, for your ways and your will. We pray, God, that as we continue to go in this mode of searching, you said, seek and you will find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, God, this is the part of the searching. God, moments where we could be doing other things. We are seeking you through your word. We are studying God, not for the purpose of just saying that we know this and that. But Father, the purpose of studying is to 
to get to know you more. Our hearts desire, our mind desire. We want to know you more. So benefit, Lord God. Bless those, Lord God, that are seeking after you. For you declared the promise that we will find you. You even went on to say, seeking you shall find, not and the door shall be opened unto you. Father, we thank you for the knocking of the door, Lord God, and the opening of the door. God, revelation, breathe it tonight. Wisdom and insight, breathe it tonight that we may walk upright and walk worthy to escape the things that are coming upon the face of the earth. And we will forever be mindful to give you the glory, honor, and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. All right. Again, like I said, so glad to have you on with us tonight. We're going to be diving into this message. And for those that have been with us, again, we've been talking about will. We started out this series with talking about will. What is the will? Um, and then how can we submit our will to God? Or how can we change our will? How can we give our wills to God? Um and that's very powerful indeed because you've heard me say this and I want to make sure that I give understanding to word and to the word. Um, change just doesn't happen overnight, but change and real change takes place through the process of time as we submit and give ourselves to God's word. Um, the Bible says, watch. If you want the enemy to flee from you, the Bible says, submit unto God. That means submit unto the Lord, right? Um, come to him. Give yourself to him, all right? Then resist the enemy and he will flee. Um, so when we get in the process, you know, we talked about a couple of good things. Um, last week, we talked about Self-denial, submission, um, you know, was our first thing, how we have to submit to God. Then self-denial, what it means to deny self. Um, Jesus said again, if any man wants to come after me, he first must deny himself. Um, Christ himself denied his self in order. And, and we live in a day and an age uh, where we have been cultured and cultivated and, and to literally discover self, all right? So the day and the age that we live in is about self-discovery, not according to the word of God, not according to God's commands or his will, but just self-discovery. And it's, it leans toward desire. It leans toward, you know, what we want more than what God wants, all right? Um... You heard me say in times past how it really does matter how we're cultured. This is why, you know, from the biblical perspective, God literally said to his people, be careful. Don't intermingle with the world. Don't intermarry with them. Be careful being with the world because when you get with the world, one or two things are going to happen. Either you're going to win them over or you're going to be cultured by them. Um, you're going to be, you know, they're going to bring you into their culture. They're going to bring you into their God. Uh, and the reality is that even though many of us have been churched or we go to church, we still live in different cultures. And you can see the cultures displayed in the behavior of the people in church, all right? Even though we are the church, you can see the culture. What are you talking about, Bishop? I'm talking about the way that we are, all right? So you can go to one church and you can see them dress a certain style of way. You can go to another church um, that may be deemed as progressive and you can see them dress another style of way. And I'm not against progressive dressing as long as it stays in the realm of biblical modesty. Not personal modesty, biblical modesty. 
Why do I say biblical modesty? Because personal modesty, what may be modest to me may not be modest to you. What may be modest to God or his word may not be modest to us because of the culture of the day. All right. This is very, very important, especially when we are talking about self-discipline and self-control. Um, typically when you walk in most churches today, and I'll never forget this. I brought a, uh, you know, I wasn't a pastor or nothing like that. Brought a guy into, um, the house of God. Uh, he was my friend. He had seen my life, um, seen, you know, uh, the type of man that I was. And he was moved to follow me because of my lifestyle. But when I took him to visit this church, um, the problem was he was worldly and dealing with flesh. Pay attention, saints of God. Pay attention, people. The issue is that, yes, the church is a hospital and people are supposed to come in. But if the leaders, if the saints, if the people that are in the building look and function like the world, Wherewith shall it be salted? What is the purpose of the light? So he came in and he was trying to listen to the message. But to be honest, some of the young ladies were dressed, you know, with tight clothing and stuff. I had learned to go beyond that, uh, learned to go beyond certain things. But to be honest, he was dealing with himself and this was what he was getting. So he was wrestling with himself. And what he said to me privately after the service, he said, man, I enjoyed the word. He said, I enjoyed the service. He said, but I can't come into the house of God and find the same thing that I'm finding in the world in the house of God, because it's going to cause me to struggle. And what he says is, I don't want to disappoint God by trying to listen to his word, but I'm looking over here at their stuff. And to be honest, I was embarrassed because here it is, this man was coming to God and he couldn't pay attention because all of the legs and all of the bosom and all of the stuff, whether man or woman, was out. Amen. I explained to him that the church was a hospital and why we need to be cultured. But this is this is the truth. The truth is we have been cultured and conditioned so much um, that literally when we talk about culturing matters, how we present ourselves and how we culture um, can either be attractive or can be a negative thing when it comes to people seeing God in us. All right. So many of us have been cultured by our countries. We've been cultured by our states. We've been cultured by our cities and we have become products of our environment. All right. We go to a building we call church and yet there are so many different in, again, how we act, how we dress and even how we think. Um, have you ever heard the phrase? That's just who I am. All right. Anybody ever heard of that phrase? That's just who I am. And it's popular on the scene today. Very popular on the scene today, but it should not be in the body of Christ. But it it's I mean, I've heard it multiple times with leaders, with different people that are professing believers. That's just who I am. All right. Um, or you've heard people say, I like the way that I am. Um, you know, I don't want to change. I like the way that I am. Um, these thoughts, this way of thinking is being planted in our consciousness. And that's our conscious mind on a daily basis. Literally, you've heard me speak about the conscious and the subconscious mind and the danger of allowing things to be planted in the conscious mind. Remember, the conscious mind receives information by the five senses, all right? By smell, sight, taste, touch, and hearing. So, the reality is we pull things into our consciousness, which then get placed in our subconscious mind. And again, the subconscious mind responds without thinking. All right. 
This is how the enemy entraps so many believers because um, he wants us to think worldly, respond worldly, see worldly, um, all of those things from that point of view. So uh, it, it, it affects us consciously until it becomes who we are. That's why we have to declare this, all right? And I want you to declare this with me, write it down, text it out, um, whatever the case may be. I want you to put this in your notes. No matter what the situation is, come on, no matter what the situation is, I can change. I'm going to say that again. No matter what the situation is, I can change. One of the biggest tricks of the adversary is to, to get us to a point where we feel like we can't change. All right? That's when the spirit of condemnation moves in. The spirit of condemnation is a feeling of hopelessness. That means the situation will never change. Now we start professing it over our lives. We start literally speaking to our life concerning this, right? So I want you to type it, get it in your notes. No matter what the situation is, I can change. That means, guess what? Your situation can change. I know the enemy's objective is to speak to you to you to you start coming, man, it, it, this is, as a man thinketh, again, in his heart, so he becomes. He wants you to dwell on that thought. But again, the word of God declares in Philippians chapter four, verse 13. You know it. You know it. Philippians chapter four, verse 13. Come on. I can do what? I can do what? All things through Christ. All right. So the key to that scripture is through Christ. Can't do it in my own strength. Can't do it in my own way. Can't do it in my own abilities. So then how can I do all things through Christ? What does that mean? Again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is culturing matters. How we are developed, how we train matters. This is why, listen, nobody expecting to run a marathon does not train. Nobody wise. You can't run a marathon and you don't train. Well, guess what? How is it that we expect to go through this life and win against the adversary? But we don't train. We feed our fleshly desires, our impulses. We give in to everything that we're cultured by through the world and through media and through the enemy. And then we say, man, I'm going to whip the devil. No, 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 no. If you don't train, ain't no way you're going to beat the enemy. All right? This is why, again, the Bible says, before the temptation of Christ, he fasted to get this under subjection and to give the Spirit of God the power so that, in other words, the the power of control over his flesh. Because the spirit of God has power over your flesh, but you still got to yield the ability to him. All right? That's the power I'm talking about. The ability for you to yield to him. Because he has power over the enemy. That's what it means by I can do all things through Christ. Christ is like, look, tag me in. I've been waiting to beat the devil through you. But the problem is you got me on the sideline. You keep fighting him without me and wondering why you're losing. All right. So, hallelujah. Let's, let's dive deeper into this because I, I, I really want to get into this. So my ability to change comes from the power and strength that I receive through the knowledge of Christ that now abides in me. Little knowledge little power. Great knowledge, great power. Little knowledge, little power. That's why the enemy attacks to stifle the knowledge that you have. 
not just speaking about worldly wisdom and worldly knowledge, but godly wisdom and godly knowledge, right? So again, my ability to change comes from the power and strength that I receive through the knowledge of Christ that now abides in me. I move in it, right? I walk in it. I talk in it and I breathe in it, all right? So that comes through the process of being developed in the things of God. So I have to allow myself to the, go through the process of development. As a child, <clears throat> that's right, tag Christ in, that's right. <clears throat> you know how we used to play tag you're in? Come on, somebody needs to tag him in, all right? As a child, a baby doesn't come out of the womb just walking along. He must go through the process of being developed to where his muscles receive strength. So he goes through the process of crawling, you know, um, sitting there, falling over till his muscles get developed. And this is why the Bible says, and they that wait upon the Lord. To wait upon the Lord does not mean to just sit there and do nothing. But to wait upon the Lord means to study, to seek his word. I'm not moving, Lord God, not until I feel you're ready for me to move. Not until I get the word. I'm not moving. Right. I'm going to wait upon you by studying the word, by praying, by fasting, by seeking instruction. Then when my muscles are developed, I can move. So. Again, from the physical development part to the spiritual development part, the reality is that we must be spiritually developed. So change comes as my mind shifts, all right? Change comes as the mind shifts. You can type that. Change comes as the mind shifts. If your mind is not shifted, change does not come. It's not easy, all right? I get people that ask, well, how are you able to do that? Or what? how can you do that? You do it because your processing of your thinking begins to change, all right? And the scripture that we use and give context to, because my mind must be set to think and respond from an elevated position. Even though I live in the earth, even though I'm in the earth, I'm not of the earth. So my mindset, my mind frame must be developed. It must be cultivated. Um, from a heavenly perspective, all right? So go to Colossians chapter three, verse one through two. Colossians chapter three, verse one, two, one through two. Amen, thank you. That's right, change comes as the mind shifts. So you gotta shift your mind, you gotta shift your thinking. But in Colossians, again, chapter three, verse one through two, the Bible says, I'm going to read it from the King James and then the NIV. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. All right. If I am born again, if I'm a new believer, if I'm a uh, uh, risen with Christ, hallelujah, if I'm born, again, then I have to learn to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth. How? Verse two, by setting your affections, setting your desires, setting your emotions, setting your attitudes on the things above, not on the things on the earth. So listen, he says, in order for there to be a mind shift, there must be an elevation of the mind. I got to know that, guess what? I got to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth. And how will my mind shift? By setting my affection, setting my mode of thinking, setting my attitude on the things above, not on the earth beneath. Now I'm going to read it from the NIV version. Let's read it from the NIV version. Amen. Amen. And it says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. 
Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse two, set your minds, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So remember when I was teaching on minds, I said this, your mindset is not just something that poof, you're born with is there, it's in you. No, your mindset is developed and cultured by the environment that you are around. What you allow into your consciousness creates a mindset. It creates a mode of thinking. So that's how you think by what you pull in. So if you pull in 90% world and 10% church, then you will always think worldly. If you pull in 40% uh, church, but 60% world, that's how you're going to think. It is only when you do as the scripture says, set my affections, change my mode of thinking, hallelujah, by setting my mind on the things above and not on the earth beneath. How? Um, you know, about a couple of months ago, I heard about Pure Flix. I had, you know, not really seen the commercials and stuff like that, but I heard about Pure Flix. Anybody know what Pure Flix is? So Pure Flix, um, literally, when we talk about Pure Flix, it's like the version of Verizon, you know, if you watch ESPN or you watch Fox Sports or Fox News or stuff like that, um, it's that type of stuff. So Pure Flix is literally a Christian um, output channel. So it, it has different shows, uh, different movies, stuff like that you can watch. And so, you know, this is how we think. Think about this. I want you to think. Watch, because I'm talking about, you know, mindset, right? So, right, Christian television. So this is how we think. Man, Pure Flix, well, how much does it cost? Oh, man, it's not free. Oh, man, they want what? Man, I ain't paying for that. But you pay $35 a month for another show. You pay $35 or $20-something dollars a month for, you know, one of these other things. Amazon Prime or, or, you know, all of these other different things. And the reality is when it comes to the things of God, oh, I can't do that. That's too much. Think about it. I, I mean, literally, I had to check myself. I had to check myself and I said, wait a second. If I can spend a hundred and some dollars on Verizon and, and watch all of these other shows, why can't I spend this amount of money on Pure Flix when it's beneficial to me? Because we have been programmed with a mindset, culture, in, I mean, th oh, hallelujah. I know y'all don't want to hear me tonight, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you grow. We're talking about self-discipline and self-control. We're going to get into it. But think about it. I'll go out and a hundred and some dollars on some shoes or clothes or whatever, but you won't spend 40 to $49 on a Bible. Oh, that's just too much. I can't do that. Uh, that's too much. Somebody says, hey, let's go to this event. Anything that deals with God or Christian stuff, we expect to be free, but we will give the world, my God have mercy, we will give the world every dime, nickel, penny, dollar that we have. But when it comes to the things of God, I can't afford it. We have been cultured and cultivated. This is why, again, he says, set your affections, set your mind, set your, so that your mindset can shift because we are constantly bombarded by the world. One of the key things that God did to, for me, one of the key things God did for me when I was coming to him was he said to me, invest in what you believe in. All right? Somebody type that out. Invest in what you believe in. 
If I believe in the word of God, there's no way that I can spend all this money on all of this other stuff. But when it comes to the things of God, I can't invest in it because, you know, that's just too much. But that's how we've been cultured to think. All right. Let me get off my soapbox. Amen. Praise the Lord. You move along. So the English translation of scriptures reflect the fact that the words self-control and self-discipline are often interchangeable. Um, a lot of times people will use them interchangeably. Self-control, self-discipline. But we're going to kind of define them tonight. All right. So that we can get some understanding of how, again, we can propel so that we can learn to submit our will to God, how we can change. All right. So watch this. Self-control. Self-control means to restrain. Hold back. Or suppress. All right. Self-control means to restrain, hold back, or suppress. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. Praise the Lord, Minister Margaret. So, if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. We're talking about self-control. And self-control means to restrain, hold back, or suppress. Amen. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse five. Watch this. This is what the word says. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Now I'm going to speak to married folk. Watch this. This is why, you know, a lot of us grew up and we were taught wrong or incorrectly. And it calls marriages to fail. It calls things to happen in marriages. Tell you better like share this video. Um, because of not understanding the word. So many marriages were destroyed for lack of wisdom. Amen. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse five. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Watch more completely to prayer. So he says, if you're going to refrain from intimacy. If you're going to refrain from intimacy, watch this. He says, let it be for a time, but you must agree upon it. This is why it talks about not marrying unequally yoked people. Because there are going to be times where God calls you to do something. And if the person doesn't understand or is not committed to God, they're going to fight. Their flesh is going to go opposite of whatever God is telling you to do. I'm just being honest. This is why I caution folk all the time. I say, listen, be careful when you marry people that are not like minded in the faith. Because if God says fast, they're going to say, OK, well, you can fast. But um, if God says because when you fast. You're supposed to come away from intimacy for a period of time, but not just to do anything. Watch what the Bible says, but to pray. Let it be for a time, a period of communion. So if I'm coming away, it's not just to sit there, but there must be some form of communion with God taking place. That's what prayer is, right? So he says again, that you may give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Because of your lack of self-control. As believers, we are called to practice self-control. Oh, well, Bishop, 
I know the church is supposed to be fasting, but, um, you know, I just, I don't feel like fasting right now. And, and wonder why your flesh be running you. Because every time God asks you to practice self-control, because fasting is not just about getting spiritually stronger. It's about putting the flesh in check. Self-control, practicing self-control. So that when the fight comes, you can resist the enemy because you've submitted to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the reality is, again, he says in Corinthians, he says, listen, practice this in intimacy by coming from each other for a period of time so that you can pray and commune with God and then go back to each other so that Satan has no right to tempt you. Well, you know, my body, I, yeah, this is my body, I do what I want to do. And that's not self-control either because self is controlling you, but you're not controlling self. There's a difference. Flesh is controlling you, but you're not controlling self. All right? Let's take it a little further. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Is it making sense? I want to make sure that we're understanding. Because again, just like I said earlier, you've been given the authority and the power of God. You have the legal right to say no to the flesh. But you can't win if you keep yielding to temptation. The more you yield to temptation, the more you feed the appetite, the more hungry you will become. So you can't get stronger by continuing to do whatever you're doing, whatever behavior, whatever appetite you're feeding. You will never be able to break the habit or break the bands of wickedness without. No, listen, I hear people say it all the time. Man, well, you know, it's, it's tough because, um, you know, my body uh, is going into withdrawals. Yes, because you've trained your body to do that. You've trained your body. If, 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 if I eat at every impulse, at every command of my flesh, if I eat every time the bo my body says eat, then when I'm getting ready to fast, ain't no way my body going to submit to me. My appetite going to try to run me crazy. This is why, again, Jesus fasted before the temptation. So that when the Bible says he was still hungry because you got flesh. When the tempter came, and said, if thou be the son of God, I know you hungry, Jesus. Command this stone to be made bread. Jesus was able to respond with self-control. Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Why? Because I've been eating on the word. I've been feasting on manna, which you know not of. My meat is to do the will of the father. I'm not merely giving in to every impulse. So you will never be able to get stronger by fulfilling every desire by simply um, eating at every impulse. Amen. That's right, Sister Sarita, because I'd be doing the same thing. I'm telling you right now, you know, again, that's that's what happened. Um, and, and it doesn't make any better because like I told you, we're being cultured in our society in America. Everything, everything, everything comes out when they go, oh, I mean, it seems like every commercial is on food. Every commercial. This burger, this sandwich. And have you noticed it just seems to get more and more clogging of the artery, arteries wise? <laughs> it seems like, you know, they got to add more to it. It was already fattening before, but now they're going to add something to it. Like, if eating the donut wasn't bad enough, now you make a donut where you put chicken in between the donut and then you add some type of special sauce and then you add something else to it. And by the time you finish in one meal setting, you have eaten your 2000 calorie diet. Now, some of you don't know that when you get older, you don't need 2000 calories. That's why you still gaining weight 
because you're still trying to fulfill your 2000 calorie diet. But the older you get, you don't need 2000 because you're not burning 2000 calories a day. If all you're doing is walk into your car to go and drive to your office and then walk into your office and then doing whatever you do, then eating and then walking back to your car and then walking back to, and driving to your home and then walking inside and going to, you're not burning 2000 calories. Come on. Does that make sense? So same way, same way spiritually, same way spiritually. All right. Hallelujah. So in order, that's just the bonus. In order for you to lose weight, you got to break down that 2000 calorie barrier and don't try to eat the 2000 calorie bet. Well, you know, I ate this and this and this is calorie counting and you don't ate way more than that because one sandwich alone was like 1500 calories. <laughs> All right. Same way spiritually, right? So I cannot, if I want to become spiritually, physically fit, then I have to beat this body into submission. How? By eating the right things. By eating the right things. By eating the right things. That's meditation. By eating the right things. Singing praises and glory unto God. That's meditation. All right? Um, by doing the right things. That's how I get spiritually strong. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Hallelujah. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. So, again, more knowledge, the greater the knowledge, the greater the ability to live a godly life. I have received because God has given everything we need for it. Living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. Again, you've heard me speak of this again. Peter gives the revelation. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my father which is in heaven. And upon this revelation, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And unto thee, I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Why? Why? Because of the revelation you have received of knowing him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Verse four. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Verse five. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. So he says, supplement, support your faith, bring and give what you call it to your faith with what? Come on, with moral excellence. The, the moral understanding of God's kingdom, not the world's, right? And knowledge. And knowledge Verse six, with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness. Again, this is breathing on that thing for self-control. All right. For instance, in Proverbs um, 29 and 11, it applauds the virtuous man or woman who holds back their tongue. That means in verse 11, it says this, fools vent their anger, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Fools vent every, oh, man, oh, blah, 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 blah. but the wise 
quietly hold it back. All right. Now, on the other hand, self-discipline. Let's deal with self-discipline. Self-discipline. All right. Self-discipline refers to the intentional, purposeful managing and determining of what we say or do. All right. Self-discipline refers to the intentional. So to be intentional, self-discipline, intentional, purposeful managing. That means intentional, purposeful managing. And determining, I got to think and determine of what we say or do. That means I got to think about it. That's self-discipline. All right. So it is the thought before the reaction. It is the thought before the reaction. All right. So we take care to compose our thoughts. Calculate our words and direct our behavior. We choose our course with discipline. And this is talking about self-discipline because I hear people say it all the time. Well, I'm not a robot. No, you are literally training yourself. You are training yourself to do what the word says. Why? Because you've already been given the fruits of the spirit when you receive the Holy Ghost. But you still got to train this flesh to obey the spirit. That's why the Bible says, and they that are led. That means you have to, um, listen, Holy Spirit, I'm giving up my right. It's a choice. It's a choice. I'm giving up my right. I'm exercising self-discipline. I know this situation happened, but I'm going to think about how I'm going to respond. I'm not just going to allow my consciousness and my subconscious behavior to overcome the word that's in me. I'm going to train myself so that when the risk, when the situation happens, I can respond from the kingdom mind and not from the earthly mind. All right. So we take care to compose our thoughts, calculate our words and direct our behavior. We choose our course with discipline. Bringing the two ideas together means that whereas we curb ungodly desires by self-control, we curb ungodly desires by self-control, we kindle holy desires with self-discipline. So we curb ungodly desires by using and exercising self-control. But then we stoke the fire, we kindle the fire of holy desires with self-discipline. I think about it before I respond. We rule out inappropriate behavior through self-control and pursue appropriate behavior through self-discipline. I'm going to say that again. We rule out inappropriate behavior through self-control and pursue Appropriate behavior through self-discipline. You see how they go hand in hand? Through self-control. I rule out inappropriate behavior. That's not the behavior God wants me to do. I'm not. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But after you have done that with self-control, through self-discipline, you pursue the appropriate behavior. So I'm not going to respond. That's self-control. But I will respond this way. That's self-discipline. Some of us have self-control but no self-discipline. Some of us have self-discipline but no self-control. And without the two working hand in hand, they become chaotic working Outside of each other. Because you need them both in order to operate. Correctly. Alright. So again. We rule out inappropriate behavior through self-control. And pursue appropriate behavior through self-discipline. 
while we restrain damaging words with self-control, we choose discreet words with self-discipline. So again, self-control, restraint. Choosing self-discipline. I know how I can respond, but I'm choosing self-control. Now I'm going to operate in self-discipline. All right. Amen. So let's let's deal with this and then we're, we're getting ready to close because like I said, to try to keep our Bible studies around an hour, hour and a half. If we think in the terms of driving a car, right? We're going to utilize this concept in, in driving a car. Um, Self-control is the braking. All right. So when something happens, you exercise self-control. You exercise self-control. So if I'm driving a car, self-control would be the brakes. If I see something ahead, if I know something's about to happen, whatever the case may be, I practice self-control. I apply self-control. All right. So self-control is the braking. Somebody type that. Self-control is the braking. Self-control is the breaking. Thank you, Sister Danielle. Amen. Self-control is the breaking. All right. Self-discipline is the accelerating or the steering. So self-discipline becomes the accelerating is the accelerator and the steering. So Self-control, again, the breaking. Something happens, I'm exercising self-control. Self-discipline is the accelerating or the steering. It's an object of head. I'm going to practice self-discipline. I've already exercised self-control. So, let's turn this way. I know my flesh wants to respond this way. But the word tells me to respond this way. All right. So, again, self-control is the breaking. Self-control is the breaking. When I say breaking, B-R-A-K-I-N-G. So that's what it means. The breaking. We're talking about breaking like when it comes to a car. Not Breaking is into break. But self-control is the braking. Because we're talking about driving a car. Self-control is the uh, the brakes. Applying the brakes. <laughs> I see a lot of people putting braking as in B-R-E-A-K-I-N-G. All right. So self-control is the braking. All right. Self-discipline is the accelerating or the steering. Amen. There we go. All right. So the importance of this is this. These disciplines of godliness, right? Distinguish the Christian life from the worldly life. It's supposed to distinguish the Christian life from the worldly life. And this is why, you know, so many people are angry with the house of God. Not with people that are just getting saved, new converts. But I hear horror stories of leaders, supposedly apostles and prophets and bishops and people with all kinds of big titles, been saved, they declare, for 15 years. But their character stinks. Don't be like them. I am cautioning you, even as he cautioned, Jesus cautioned the disciples. Don't eat the leavening of the scribes and the Pharisees. 
Don't be hypocritical. Don't say one thing, but live something completely different. Because the world is watching. People are watching. And so this is supposed to be a distinguishing characteristic of the church. We're supposed to know how to be self-disciplined and how to exercise self-control. That's supposed to be the body of Christ. Hallelujah. That's why, again, so many people get upset. Oh, you having a whole bunch of babies, and but you say, and the excuse that the enemy has interjected is, oh, everybody sins. I don't care if everybody sins. That's not an excuse for me to sin. What you think God is going to say? Well, you know, everybody sinned. So, you know, it was all right what you did. No. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't do it. Don't do it. So we got to come out of this mental cultivation because you hear people say it. And that's the excuse now. That's the enemy injected excuse where everybody sins, where everybody falls short of the glory of God. Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but that's no excuse to sin. That's, if anything, that's given us so that we don't become so self-righteous that we look down on everybody else and judge them where we've been at ourselves. God delivered you out the club. Now you talking, man, look at them over there in the club. They in the club and they, but you forget God saved you out of the club. That's more what it's meant for. God saved you from being a liar, but you, oh man, they a liar and they do this and that. But God saved you from doing the same thing. Now you judging everybody. No, that's what it was meant for. That's what it meant for. To take an examination so you don't judge with that creator. Judge, least you be judged with the same judgment, which means to condemn unto death. Not to judge from the basis of what the scripture speaks, because the Bible says that we are to judge. You are the salt and the light of the earth. That word judge, when it says judge not, used to be judged with the same judgment. That judge means to condemn unto death. But we are to judge the world. We are Lights in the world. Your life is meant to judge the world, to show the world that they're not supposed to live like that. That's why we are the example. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So we are surrounded by those who have lost command of their mouth. Come on. Emotions, imaginations, appetites, sexualities, insecurities, and cravings, and have descended into a moral depravity. And it's according to scripture. The Bible talks about how in these days that men will go into that realm. They'll go into that place where everything becomes okay, right? But in contrast, in how we're supposed to live, the Christian has learned to be content with what is enough, what is reasonable, what is chaste, and what is discreet and moderate, and will sow it in peace. So we are the counter to what the world is. We are not supposed to be like the world. We're supposed to be different. So exercise self-discipline, exercise self-control and allow it to work in you, right? In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he tells them as he's building them up. So Paul goes and uh, God tells him to go to Macedonia. God says to Paul, go to Macedonia. I want you to do a work there in Macedonia because there's no synagogues for me there. Only um, 
the enemy's synagogues. So I want you to go there and establish a synagogue for me. That's a church. I want you to establish a, a dwelling place for me, says the Lord. So Paul goes to Philippia, right? And what he says is, allow your minds to be elevated and think on the good things, right? Go to Philippians chapter four, verse six through nine. I'll make it, make it a reality by simply giving some understanding. Amen. That's right. Christ culture. And that's how we're supposed to be. I really believe there's a kingdom movement that is Christ centered and Christ culture, kingdom culture, not, you know, worldly culture or even city culture or nation culture because we're cultured by our environment. But Christ is trying to culture us because we got way too much. What's offensive to you may not be offensive to me. But is it offensive to God? Is it offensive to the kingdom? All right. So Philippians. Thank you, Sister Monique. Chapter four, verse six through nine from the King James Version. And then I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. So he tells the, the Philippian church to build up their minds and be built up through elevation of their thoughts on good things that pertain to the kingdom of God. But I like how he conveys the message because not only have you learned, but received, heard, and seen it through my actions. This is why leaders, it is important to be the light. You can't tell folk, follow me, and they see your nasty attitude. And you talking about follow me. They see how you respond to people, how you treat people, what you do to folk. And you talking about follow me. Ain't nobody following you. That is the delusion that is in our own minds. Come on. Amen. Can I be real? That's the delusion that's in our, oh, follow me. I don't understand why people ain't following me. They ain't following you because they see for you for what you are. You can't love nobody. You can't even talk to people outside of church. Or, or be cordial with folk. But you talking about follow me. And I'm not just talking about PWL. I'm talking about the body of Christ in general. Come on. Your neighbors. You talking about go to church with me. But when was the last time you did something kind for them? When was the last time that you were a light to them? I didn't say you went around. Oh, and the word of God says. And the word of God said. Man, when was the last time you did something for them? Or oh, I just bought you this uh, cause you were on my mind. Stuff that people don't do no more. Amen. Philippians chapter four, verse six through nine. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Somebody's Type, think on these things. That's the elevation of the mind. Think on these things. While the world is thinking about everything else, he says, think on these things. Verse nine, those things which you have both learned and received, because it's no good if you just learned it, but you ain't received it, and heard, Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the reception of the word of God, all right? Faith is developed by hearing. That's what that scripture means. Faith is developed by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Why do you think the Bible says that we are encouraged by the words of our testimony? Amen. So 
those things which you have both learned, received, heard, and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right? So I'm going to read Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9 from the New Living Translation. And now, dear brothers and sisters, verse 8, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Now, he's not telling you what is your truth. Perspective can kill without understanding. Perspective can kill without understanding. Perspective can kill without understanding. Hallelujah. Type that down, write it down, put it in your notes, because it is the truth. Perspective can kill without understanding because everybody has a perspective. Your perspective of that person may be a perceived perspective, but without understanding, it may not be true. So when he says, when he says, come on, amen, to Fix your thoughts on what is true. I owe it to myself and to the other person to know what is the truth. Not just, well, I already know what I, you know, I know, I know. You don't know. You just think that's your perspective, but you don't know. Come on. How many of you have somebody perceived something about that wasn't true? I guarantee it's almost everybody. In a lifetime, you're going to run around or run by at least one person that perceives something about you that is completely not true. And their perception came from a preconceived notion that they received either from somebody, an environment, the day, or the age, whatever the case may be. But that's the truth. So perspectives can kill without understanding and it must be understood. So he says, amen, from the New Living Translation, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise and keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Keep putting into practice. It's important to practice. Then the God of peace will be with you. He says, if you want the peace of God to be with you, then you have to put your mind. You got to fix your mind on these things. What are you thinking about all day? What's your thoughts all day? Are your thoughts controlled by the world and the environment from which you are in? Or are your thoughts controlled by the kingdom? Are you a kingdom thinker? Hallelujah. He's teaching and training you how to think kingdomly. When a kingdom thinker comes in, we don't look at everything from the negative perspective. When I see the storm rise, I'm excited about the storm. You know why? Because I realize my life is in the hand of my God. And if he is allowing the storm to rise, he's about to do something spectacular. And I'm excited because I got front row seats. Ha, somebody needs to give him praise for front row seats. Come on. Your mind will change. God, wait a second. You allowed me to witness this? I get front row seats. To see the glory of the kingdom manifested. When you're a kingdom thinker, you understand that. Self-discipline, come on, and self-control. Self-discipline and self-control. Self-discipline and self-control. For the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Christ gives not as the world gives. For the world gives fear 
and timidity. But God gives love and self-discipline. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. Come on. God does not give like the world gives. The world interjects fear. Come on. And timidity. But God gives power, love, and self-discipline. Will you open up for him today? Will you open up for him today? Man, listen. I want to keep going, but I'm going to stop there. For the sake of time, there's some more that we have to go over. Um, but again, like I said, I want to be true to our time frame. You know, people tease us as believers for being naive and inexperienced because we avoid attitudes and activities that others readily embrace. I, I have been accused many times in my life of, you know, not thinking, well, everybody don't think like that. But it's because I have embraced kingdom thinking because I won't give my power to people by giving them the attitude they want. I won't give my power to people by giving them my, my time and, and all of that stuff. I, I won't do it. When you when they want to argue and you start arguing back with them, you're giving them your power. I refuse to give you my power. I refuse to give you. The, nope, nope, not going to do it. You're important to me, but I'm not giving you that power. I love you, but I'm not giving you that authority over me. So you have to learn how to exercise self-control and self-discipline. Hallelujah. Self-control and self-discipline. The world wants us to respond. The world wants us to be like it is. But will you choose to be different? That's the question. Will you choose to be different? Listen, this is Pastor James Manigault, Bishop James Manigault. I want to thank you for tuning in. Again, we gave the understanding of how we are coming to that place of giving up will, our will to Christ. The necessity for it. Jesus did it. He did it from the beginning and he did it in the garden, even before death. And he's asking you to give up your will. See, with will, he can't take it because he, he gave it to you freely. But you have to give up your will in exchange for his. And he won't take it. You have to give it. That's why Christ said, not my will. He could have chose to say, nope, I'm going to do it my way. But he chose to say, not my will. Thy will be done. And in order to reach that place, we have to learn to exercise self-discipline and understand self-control. This is Bishop James Manigault again of PWL Ministries. Thank you for tuning in. I want to connect with you. I want to connect with you. Man, if you enjoy these messages, please leave comments to let us know that you're enjoying the messages. Go to our website um, and you can click on the link and leave a message. Hey, you know, I love this ministry, this church. You can actually go on and just, uh, I believe, Google and different things. They have ways that you can connect with us. Um, if you would like to be a part of this fellowship, maybe you don't have a church home or maybe you're looking for a church home and you're in the Baltimore area or maybe you're abroad. We want you to connect with us. Go to our website. Um, we have membership online for those that are online members. Um, also, for those that want to come and be in the building, we will be in the building this Sabbath. Hey, I'm excited and I want to see you there. Um, we have a lot of good things that are coming up for the summer months and for the summertime. Um, you don't want to miss it. I'm telling you right now, great things are ahead of you. I want to impact your community with you and help you to become a kingdom life changer. In order to do that, we want to get your information. If you'll let us know, you can go to our messenger and say, Hey, I'd like to be a kingdom life changer. I want to connect with you. I'm telling you right now, I want to be a partner with you. We're going to partner with you. We thank you for all of your contributions. Remember those that are giving, um, you know, this is your time where you can, uh, give when we put on the music. You can go to the website. We have many different ways to give. Um, if you want to bless me personally, you can uh, go to my cash app, dollar sign James Manigault. 
Um, every gift is tax deductible and is appreciated. Um, again, we are expanding. We're doing great things uh, for the kingdom of God. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you. Um, with that being said, let's pray. Let's pray. Maybe you're not saved and you're saying, hey, I want to be saved. Um, we have ministers that are online right now. Um, and you can simply type a message and say, hey, I need prayer. Or can you connect with me? And they will connect will with you. Um, I'm telling you right now, it's a great time, great time to be a part of this fellowship and this ministry. I love you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for what you have done and what you're doing. Father, I pray that you would move by your spirit. Lord, so many of us need to learn how to practice self-control and self-discipline. Grow in it. You've given us, Lord God, these gifts. Help us to exercise them. They're not just going to grow because we didn't do anything, but we must be intentional about our growth. For the world indeed is looking at us. Even as you said you were the light of the world, you then turn around and call us according to Matthew chapter 5, the salt and the light of the earth. Help us to be the sight, salt and the light, to change people by what they see in us and let it be you. And we'll forever be mindful to give you the glory, honor, and the praise. We pray for Ukraine. We pray, God, for Russia. We pray, God, for these countries and these men, God, that are impacted and devastated by demonic activity. For you said, the thief cometh not, but to kill, steal, and destroy. We speak life now. We speak life now. In the name of Jesus. Life to every believer that's watching. Cause their situations and circumstances to change and help us to grow into the image and the expression of your son. And we will forever be mindful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, this is Bishop James Manigault. Love you, love you, love you. You can't make me stop loving you. Thank you for tuning in. Like, share this video, and we'll see you next time. Amen. Let's worship. from the well.
Mm-hmm.